Life is short, have an affair. Well, that's Ashley Madison's advice. Ashley Madison is a website set up for people who want to commit adultery, obviously without their spouse knowing, want to do it in a discreet, hidden, deceptive way. The thing about Ashley Madison, nine years ago, as millions of people had signed up to this website to have illicit, adulterous connections with people, is that there was a massive hack of the website and millions of people's names and personal details about them, the, who they were and their particular desires, etc., were then leaked out gradually into the media. And I remember Ed Stetzer tweeting at the time and sharing at the time that 400 pastors, elders, deacons, church leaders were on the Ashley Madison list. I was reminded of this recently when there was a Netflix series popped up on my Netflix feed, the Ashley Madison scandal, the data hack. And I thought, I remember that because I wrote a blog post on it after I'd read Ed Stetzer and dived into the details of the fact that 400 church leaders were on the Ashley Madison list looking for adultery, looking for an affair. I prefer the word adultery. It's more blunt. It's candid. And I think it faces the reality of the sin that's involved here. The Netflix series really dived into the the impact of that data hack and how it happened. They interviewed staff, people whose names are on the list or spouses, and they interviewed a professor's wife from uh, the South Bible Belt of the States whose husband had been discovered that he was on that list and because of that exposure and the shame and the guilt, took his life. And it brought home to me again the impact of moral scandals upon churches. I remember as a young pastor, the, one of the heroes of my faith walk at that time, my pastoral journey at that time, fell morally, a huge scandal in the Australasian church. And I remember the overwhelming feeling of, my goodness, it, if that happens to me, to him rather, not to me, if that happens to him, what hope do I have? I mean, he's a man of God. He's an amazing leader big church, great preacher, and obviously walking with Jesus, and yet he falls morally. What hope for me in these situations? And I remember the deep feelings of insecurity and being unsettled and overwhelmed with this news. So it's kind of giving me pause, the Ashley Madison series on Netflix, that I think is, is worth watching in terms of the impact on people's lives of, of adultery, of immorality, and the impact I think especially on churches when pastors and key church leaders decide to go down this track. So what should churches do if they discover that their pastor, maybe an associate pastor, um, maybe a board member, someone of, of standing in the church, it, it's unveiled that they've been living in adultery. They've been in deceiving uh, attitudes and acts have betrayed their marriage vows. They've taken the path that is definitely a destructive path. Well, here's a number of things that I, that I want to share with you today that I think can help guide churches when there is a moral scandal at this level. I think first you have to have some guiding values. And I have six guiding values. I'm not going to go into depth on them all, but I have six guiding values that I think about and utilize in any of these handlings of moral scandals that we've had to deal with in our own church church, or where I've helped others as well in other churches. What are these guiding values? One is transparency. You, you can't cover up. You can't hide. You have to be transparent about what has occurred. The second value balances this out. You must also have dignity in that transparency. Uh, you don't want to be sharing salacious facts and details that take you into an undignified place, yet you don't want to do a cover-up. You have to be transparent enough for people to know that immorality has occurred, yet there can be, there will be innocent people in that. There's the spouse of the pastor or the church leader who has fallen morally. There may be a family members that are unaware and are as shocked as everybody else. So there needs to be a level of dignity in that transparency. 
Another key value, a guiding value is shepherding. You have to bring to the fore, not a corporate attitude, but a shepherd's heart into the whole situation. Integrity must be a guiding value, doing what is right. There must be mercy as well. It cannot be all justice and judgment and guilt and shame. There must be a flow, a river of mercy through all of this, not to the point of, oh, it doesn't matter. It was only a, sim a short affair. I'm not talking about that sort of greasy grace, but I'm talking bring mercy into the picture when you're dealing with the difficulty of this situation. The sixth guiding value, which you're going to need in spades, is courage, the courage to face the scandal, the courage to face the members of the church, the courage to deal with this with transparency, with dignity, a shepherd's heart, with integrity and mercy. So you've got those guiding values in place. They're going to help be your railway tracks so that you can run down to guide you how you handle all the various communications and the pastoral needs and the care of people in guiding them into the future. Make sure that you gather facts. The Bible's very clear. You never receive an accusation against a pastor, an elder, a key leader, unless there are two or three witnesses. The Bible protects us from just slander that is designed to throw mud at us. Gather the facts. You'll hear stories. You'll hear rumors, but stick with the facts of the matter. Confirm those allegations, confirm those facts before you take action. Also, another key thing to remember is sexual sin is different. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 19, Paul says that when you sin sexually, you sin against your own body. And I love what uh, Pastor Jack Hayford said many years ago when I was listening to his messages on why sex sin is different. He talked about the fact that sexual sin against the body is against the body of your entire life. And I like that interpretation, that view of that scripture. It's not just against your physical body you're sinning. You're sinning against the body of your relationships, the body of your legacy, the body of your leadership, the body of your pastoral ministry. You're sinning against that entire body of work and of life and relationships, and it has a massive impact. You know, over the many years of uh, pastoring, I would never have people come into my office and say, look, I, I was jealous 15 years ago, and I, I'm still struggling with the guilt of that jealousy. Uh, that wouldn't occur, but I'll tell you, people who have committed immorality will come and many years later talk about the scar it's left, the mark it's left, their immorality that still remnants of guilt, remnants of shame, remnants of why did I do that that remain. Make no mistake about it. Sexual sin is different, I believe, to other sins. No doubt that in the process and in the journey of handling a scandal of this nature in your church, the pastor should resign and if doesn't, should be asked to resign. And if won't resign, then should be dismissed. I don't think adultery is something that you just take a two-month sabbatical from and you're back in the pulpit. I'm, I'm kind of old school on this one. I think once you've committed adultery, you've broken your marriage vows, you've, you've done massive damage, significant damage to your church, to your friends, let alone your family. I think a resignation is absolutely in order when adultery has occurred. And I'm even very old school that if adultery has occurred between a pastor and a staff member or a church member, that a pastor should leave the ministry and never go back into it. I think the power imbalance in that situation means it's, it's more than sexual sin. There's a sin of power. There's an abuse of power that I think has played out there that I think a pastor needs to go, you know what? I've blown my opportunity. I need to move on to another vocation, another work aspect of my life. I'm old school and not everyone's going to agree with that, but that's okay. I'm happy for everyone not to agree with me on that, but that's where I stand on that. I think also in the process, you need to consider all the stakeholders in, in how you handle this moral scandal. There's the pastor's family. There's the board, the staff members who were deeply impacted by this. Key leaders who have sacrificially sown into the life of your church have been betrayed at a deep level. The members of your church, and some of them will be long-term 
people who have who have stayed with the church through good years and bad years and this is an affront to them and they need to be pastored and shepherded very well and of course the community so when you're looking at your communications whether they're face to face in person or in writing think through all the different stakeholders that you need to connect with when you're dealing with a matter of this level of scandal and impact I think it's important in the process to hold special members meetings, to actually have a meeting outside, of course, your Sunday service. You may need to make a public announcement on Sunday, but have special meetings where you can outline with a combination of transparency yet dignity, you can outline the scenarios that you need to outline to your congregation, to your leaders, to your church. Don't just try and do a a bit of an announcement on Sunday morning, leave it at that. People will make up stories if you don't fill the gap with excellent communication and special meetings can really help that process. And a final word about this. I think when a pastor resigns under the weight of a moral scandal, then I think sometimes it's actually helpful and healthy to bring in an experienced veteran pastor as an interim pastor for a few months to help the church heal, to help the church start a process of assessment, of honestly evaluating where they've been, where they're at and where they're going. And I think sometimes asking a board or staff members to take that role of leadership during this time can be too difficult. The shell shock can be too much and bad decisions can be made at that time. And there can be a sudden appointment of another pastor well, let's make the associate the lead pastor now. Let's just get on with it. I, I think rushing those major decisions at that time uh, is a mistake. And I think the way to avoid that, one way is to have an interim pastor come in and lead the church for a while. I think these moral scandals are so damaging to the life of a church. It does take years to recover. And how a church with their guiding values, can handle it and lead and shepherd their congregation, can really make a vital difference in the healing and the recovery of that church.